General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade GATT was a legal agreement between many countries, whose overall purpose was to promote international trade by reducing or eliminating trade barriers such as tariffs or quotas. According to its preamble, its purpose was the "...substantial reduction of tariffs and other trade barriers and the elimination of preferences, on a reciprocal and mutually advantageous basis." It was first discussed during the United Nations Conference on Trade and Employment and was the outcome of the failure of negotiating governments to create the International Trade Organization GATT was signed by 23 nations in Geneva on 30 October 1947, and took effect on 1 January 1948. It remained in effect until the signature by 123 nations in Marrakesh on 14 April 1994, of the Uruguay Round Agreements, which established the World Trade Organization WTO on 1 January 1995. The WTO is a successor to GATT, and the original GATT text GATT 1947, is still in effect under the WTO framework, subject to the modifications of GATT 1994. GATT, and its successor WTO, have successfully reduced tariffs. The average tariff levels for the major GATT participants were about 22% in 1947, but were 5% after the Uruguay Round in 1999. Experts attribute part of these tariff changes to GATT and the WTO. Topic: <inaudible> Rounds. <inaudible> GATT held a total of 9 rounds. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Annecy Round 1949. The second round took place in 1949 in Annecy, France. Thirteen countries took part in the round. The main focus of the talks was more tariff reductions, around 5,000 in total. Topic: <laughs> Torquay Round, 1951. The third round occurred in Torquay, England, in 1951. Thirty-eight countries took part in the round. 8,700 tariff concessions were made totaling the remaining amount of tariffs to three-quarters of the tariffs which were in effect in 1948. The contemporaneous rejection by the U.S. of the Havana Charter signified the establishment of the GATT as a governing world body. <laughs> Geneva Round, 1955–56 The fourth round returned to Geneva in 1955 and lasted until May 1956. 26 countries took part in the round. $2.5 billion in tariffs were eliminated or reduced. <laughs> Dillon Round, 1960–62 The fifth round occurred once more in Geneva and lasted from 1960 to 1962. The talks were named after U.S. Treasury Secretary and former Under Secretary of State, Douglas Dillon, who first proposed the talks. Twenty-six countries took part in the round. Along with reducing over $4.9 billion in tariffs, it also yielded discussion relating to the creation of the European Economic Community EEC. Kennedy Round, 1962–67 The sixth round of GATT multilateral trade negotiations, held from 1963 to 1967. It was named after U.S. President John F. Kennedy in recognition of his support for the reformulation of the United States trade agenda, which resulted in the Trade Expansion Act of 1962. This act gave the president the widest ever negotiating authority. As the Dillon Round went through the laborious process of item-by-item -item tariff negotiations, it became clear, long before the round ended, that a more comprehensive approach was needed to deal with the emerging challenges resulting from the formation of the European Economic Community and EFTA, as well as Europe's re-emergence as a significant international trader more generally. Japan's high economic growth rate portended the major role it would play later as an exporter, but the focal point of the Kennedy Round always was the United States EEC relationship. 
Indeed, there was an influential American view that saw what became the Kennedy Round as the start of a transatlantic partnership that might ultimately lead to a transatlantic economic community. To an extent, this view was shared in Europe, but the process of European unification created its own stresses under which the Kennedy Round at times became a secondary focus for the EEC. An example of this was the French veto in January 1963, before the round had even started, on membership by the United Kingdom. Another was the internal crisis of 1965, which ended in the Luxembourg Compromise. Preparations for the new round were immediately overshadowed by the Chicken War, an early sign of the impact variable levies under the common agricultural policy would eventually have. Some participants in the round had been concerned that the convening of UNCTAD, scheduled for 1964, would result in further complications, but its impact on the actual negotiations was minimal. In May 1963 ministers reached agreement on three negotiating objectives for the round. A measures for the expansion of trade of developing countries as a means of furthering their economic development. B reduction or elimination of tariffs and other barriers to trade, and C. Measures for access to markets for agricultural and other primary products. The working hypothesis for the tariff negotiations was a linear tariff cut of 50% with the smallest number of exceptions. A drawn-out argument developed about the trade effects a uniform linear cut would have on the dispersed rates low and high tariffs quite far apart of the United States as compared to the much more concentrated rates of the EEC which also tended to be in the lower held of United States tariff rates. The EEC accordingly argued for an evening out or harmonization of peaks and troughs through its Sermont, Double Cart and 30, 10 proposals. Once negotiations had been joined, the lofty working hypothesis was soon undermined. The special structure countries Australia, Canada, New Zealand and South Africa, so-called because their exports were dominated by raw materials and other primary commodities, negotiated their tariff reductions entirely through the item-by-item -item method. In the end, the result was an average 35% reduction in tariffs, except for textiles, chemicals, steel and other sensitive products, plus a 15% to 18% reduction in tariffs for agricultural and food products. In addition, the negotiations on chemicals led to a provisional agreement on the abolition of the American Selling Price ASP. This was a method of valuing some chemicals used by the noted states for the imposition of import duties which gave domestic manufacturers a much higher level of protection than the tariff schedule indicated. However, this part of the outcome was disallowed by Congress, and the American selling price was not abolished until Congress adopted the results of the Tokyo Round. The results on agriculture overall were poor. The most notable achievement was agreement on a Memorandum of Agreement on Basic Elements for the negotiation of a World Grants Arrangement, which eventually was rolled into a new International Grains Arrangement. The EEC claimed that for it the main result of the negotiations on agriculture was that they "...greatly helped to define its own common policy." The developing countries, who played a minor role throughout the negotiations in this round, benefited nonetheless from substantial tariff cuts particularly in non-agricultural items of interest to them. Their main achievement at the time, however, was seen to be the adoption of Part 4 of the GATT, which absolved them from according reciprocity to developed countries in trade negotiations. In the view of many developing countries, this was a direct result of the call at UNCTADI for a better trade deal for them. There has been argument ever since whether this symbolic gesture was a victory for them, or whether it ensured their exclusion in the future from meaningful participation in the multilateral trading system. On the other hand, there was no doubt that the extension of the long-term arrangement regarding international trade in cotton textiles, which later became the multi-fiber arrangement, for three years until 1970 led to the longer-term impairment of export opportunities for developing countries. Another outcome of the Kennedy Round was the adoption of an anti-dumping code, which gave more precise guidance on the implementation of Article 6 of the GATT. In particular, it sought to ensure speedy and fair investigations, and it imposed limits on the retrospective application of anti-dumping measures. Kennedy Round took place from 1962 to 1967. Forty billion dollars in tariffs were eliminated or reduced. Topic. Tokyo Round, 1973–79 In 
reduced tariffs and established new regulations aimed at controlling the proliferation of non-tariff barriers and voluntary export restrictions. 102 countries took part in the round. Concessions were made on $19 billion worth. <inaudible> Uruguay Round, 1986–94 The Uruguay Round began in 1986. It was the most ambitious round to date, hoping to expand the competence of the GATT to important new areas such as services, capital, intellectual property, textiles, and agriculture. 123 countries took part in the round. The Uruguay round was also the first set of multilateral trade negotiations in which developing countries had played an active role. Agriculture was essentially exempted from previous agreements as it was given special status in the areas of import quotas and export subsidies, with only mild caveats. However, by the time of the Uruguay round, many countries considered the exception of agriculture to be sufficiently glaring that they refused to sign a new deal without some movement on agricultural products. These 14 countries came to be known as the Cairns Group, and included mostly small and medium-sized agricultural exporters such as Australia, Brazil, Canada, Indonesia, and New Zealand. The agreement on agriculture of the Uruguay Round continues to be the most substantial trade liberalization agreement in agricultural products in the history of trade negotiations. The goals of the agreement were to improve market access for agricultural products, reduce domestic support of agriculture in the form of price distorting subsidies and quotas, eliminate over time export subsidies on agricultural products and to harmonize to the extent possible sanitary and phytosanitary measures between member countries. GATT and the World Trade Organization In 1993, the GATT was updated GATT 1994 to include new obligations upon its signatories. One of the most significant changes was the creation of the World Trade Organization WTO. The 75 existing GATT members and the European communities became the founding members of the WTO on 1 January 1995. The other 52 GATT members rejoined the WTO in the following two years the last being Congo in 1997. Since the founding of the WTO, 21 new non-GATT members have joined and 29 are currently negotiating membership. There are a total of 164 member countries in the WTO, with Liberia and Afghanistan being the newest members as of 2016. Of the original GATT members, Syria and the SFR Yugoslavia have not rejoined the WTO. Since FR Yugoslavia, renamed as Serbia and Montenegro and with membership negotiations later split in two, is not recognized as a direct SFRY successor state, therefore, its application is considered a new non -GATT one. The General Council of WTO, on 4 May 2010, agreed to establish a working party to examine the request of Syria for WTO membership. The contracting parties who founded the WTO ended official agreement of the GATT 1947 terms on 31 December 1995. Montenegro became a member in 2012, while Serbia is in the decision stage of the negotiations and is expected to become a member of the WTO in the future. Whilst GATT was a set of rules agreed upon by nations, the WTO is an institutional body. As such, GATT was merely a forum for nations to discuss, while the WTO is a proper international organization which implies physical headquarters, staff, delegation. The WTO expanded its scope from traded goods to include trade within the service sector and intellectual property rights. Although it was designed to serve multilateral agreements, during several rounds of GATT negotiations particularly the Tokyo Round, plurilateral agreements created selective trading and caused fragmentation among members. WTO arrangements are generally a multilateral agreement settlement mechanism of GATT. <laughs> <laughs> Effects on trade liberalization The average tariff levels for the major GATT participants were about 22% in 1947. As a result of the first negotiating rounds, tariffs were reduced in the GATT core of the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia, relative to other contracting parties and non-GATT participants. 
By the Kennedy Round 1962 the average tariff levels of GATT participants were about 15%. After the Uruguay round, tariffs were under 5%. In addition to facilitating applied tariff reductions, the early GATT's contribution to trade liberalization include binding the negotiated tariff reductions for an extended period, made more permanent in 1955, establishing the generality of non-discrimination through most favored nation (MFN) treatment and national treatment, ensuring increased transparency of trade policy measures, and providing a forum for future negotiations and for the peaceful resolution of bilateral disputes. All of these elements contributed to the rationalization of trade policy and the reduction of trade barriers and policy uncertainty." According to Dartmouth economic historian Douglas Irwin, The prosperity of the world economy over the past half-century owes a great deal to the growth of world trade which, in turn, is partly the result of farsighted officials who created the GATT. They established a set of procedures giving stability to the trade policy environment and thereby facilitating the rapid growth of world trade. With the long run in view, the original GATT conferees helped put the world economy on a sound foundation and thereby improved the livelihood of hundreds of millions of people around the world. See also Cultural exception most favored nation GATS special and differential treatment